Okay, uh, we're going to go ahead and start, although everybody hasn't had a chance to get lunch. You know, please continue to help yourself um, to lunch. But thank you so much for being here. And I am beyond delighted and honored to be able to introduce you to Professor Michael Gratz. Um, many of you actually already know him because many of you have learned tax from his case book. Um, which both, so if you had either Professor Nauer or me for tax, you've learned tax from Professor Gratz and his co-author, um, Deborah Skenk. Um, and he tells me he has a new edition, which is not going to be longer, coming out for the fall. Um, so if I actually properly introduce Professor Gratz, we would be here, I would be up here until one o'clock, and you don't want that, so he's not going to get a proper fulsome introduction. I'm going to hit the highlights. His resume is 11 pages long. It's available on the web if you're really interested. Um, but Professor Gratz is one of the most notable, respected, and prolific scholars working today. Um, he is currently a chaired professor at Columbia Law School, where he's been since 2009. Uh, prior to that, he was a chaired professor at the Yale Law School um, from 1983 to um, 2009. And before that, he taught at his alma mater, the University of Virginia. He got, so he got his JD from Virginia and his undergraduate degree from Emory. In addition to teaching, he has been involved in public service. Um, so he was the Deputy Assistant Treasury Secretary for Tax Policy from 1990 to 91. That's under the presidency of George Bush the Elder. And he was also at the Treasury in the late 60s, early 70s as an attorney advisor to the Assistant Secretary for Tax Policy. He has many honors, um, of which I'm only gonna mention a few. He is a fellow for, for the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He received the David Holland Medal for Outstanding Contributions to the Study and Practice of Public Finance from the National Tax Association. Um, he is a Guggenheim Fellow. He was selected for Esquire Register in 1998 for courses and work in connection with the provision of shelter for the homeless. He's the recipient of the Treasury Medal from the Treasury Department and of the Treasury Department's um, Exceptional Service Award for his role in formulating tax policy. In addition to some of his the books that I have up here. Um, I could not carry physically all of the 10 books that he has written. Most recently um, on the um, Supreme Court, uh, the Burger Court and the Rise of the Judicial Right, which he wrote with uh, Linda Greenhouse. He has also written on energy um, and um, his mo most recent book is Follow the Money, Essays on International Taxation. He's also edited four books, contributed chapters to 18, and written a gazillion articles, all of many of which um, show his adeptness at catchy titles. And I will tell you that my personal favorite is to praise the estate tax, not to bury it. Um, I think that is an inspired title. So, um, I think without further ado, I'm going to sit down and turn the podium over to Professor Gratz, who will deliver the Fogel Lecture. And thank you very much. Thank you, Alice. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here uh, and to see a room this crowded. Uh, my assumption is that the pizza must be very good. <laughs> Uh, people are shaking their heads now. Not, not, so, not so much, right? So uh, if it's not the pizza, then I'm uh, particularly honored. Um, I, I want to uh, uh, begin uh, discussing the 2017 uh, tax legislation um, by just reviewing briefly the process that led to its enactment, because I think its process 
will tell you a lot about its substance. Um, whatever its political benefits and costs, uh, this tax bill took an unprecedented path uh, to enactment. In April of 2017, uh, President Trump provided one page of principles and another half page uh, that uh, outlined specific goals for tax reform. Uh, three months later, at the end of July, uh, the uh, self-named Big Six, I call them the Sixers, but in this town that probably is confusing, <clears throat> but the uh, Big Six, uh, which was the Secretary of the Treasury, uh, Steve Mnuchin, the National Economic Council Director, Gary Cohn, the Senate Majority Leader, uh, Mitch McConnell, uh, the Senate Finance Committee Chairman Orrin Hatch, uh, the Speaker of the House Paul Ryan, and the Ways and Means uh, Chairman uh, Kevin Brady of Texas, uh, who they had been meeting uh, regularly before this July uh, release, and they released a, a statement that repeated uh, their goals for more economic growth through lower tax rates on businesses and individuals, uh, and a reform of international tax rules, uh, greater fairness, uh, principally through lower taxes on individuals, and of course, less complexity. Uh, soon thereafter, 45 of the 48 Senate Republicans signed a letter that they sent to Senator McConnell uh, containing their three principles for tax reform, uh, two of which were that it not uh, benefit the wealthiest individuals, the deficit. Uh, Senator McConnell rejected uh, those constraints uh, in a Kentucky minute. Uh, then, uh, during the first week of September, Secretary Mnuchin announced that the group of six now had a detailed tax reform plan. Uh, NEC Director Cohn described it as a skeleton uh, plan, uh, by which he surely meant to suggest it needed some flesh, uh, not that it was uh, dead and awaiting burial. Um, on September 15th, Chairman Brady said that the tax plan, which was now scheduled for release during the week of September 25th, uh, would not say exactly what the new business tax rate would be. Uh, Secretary uh, Mnuchin then immediately said that the plan would announce the rate. Uh, Donald Trump said the rate would be 15% on corporations, which everybody knew was lower than it would be by at least five uh, percentage uh, points. So things were going very smoothly at that time, uh, just like the... Uh, Republicans' effort to repeal and replace the uh, Act. Uh, then on uh, September 27th, uh, the Sixers released their unified framework for fixing our broken tax code. Uh, it was nine pages long, about a third of which were blank space. Um, and they set forth a list of their proposed tax changes which included a corporate tax rate of 20% and a special 25% uh, tax rate for partnerships and subchapter S corporations. Uh, they labeled uh, the latter a special uh, rate for small businesses, uh, even though nearly two thirds of the net income of uh, partnerships uh, is earned by the largest 1% of firms with more than $50 million in assets, and more than 70% of that income ends up in the pockets of the top 1%. On the individual side, the Sixers uh, framework was especially vague. It announced an aim to reduce the current seven tax brackets to three, ranging from 12 to 35%. Uh, but the framework failed to say at what levels of income the new rates uh, would come in. Uh, and they promised to double the standard deduction and replace personal exemptions with tax credits for children and other dependents. Uh, one uh, large, uh, well-known New York uh, law firm uh, told its clients 
professors had handed us a frame without a picture. Uh, months later, uh, with no public hearings and input only from lobbyists, the full picture was completed. And the far reaching legislation that President Trump signed that December contained more than 500 pages of statutory amendments to the Internal Revenue Code. Uh, to give you a sense of comparison, the 1986 Tax Reform Act spent 53 weeks in Congress, and two years before that, Treasury had released more than 600 pages analyzing the various tax reform ideas that it had considered. And in May of 1985, Reagan released nearly a 500-page document detailing his proposal. Um, the Tax Reform Act of 86 uh, was described by Reagan as domestic policy achievement of his presidency. Uh, it was widely heralded as the most important tax legislation since the income tax was extended to the masses uh, to finance World War II. Although there had been a long, there, although there had long been uh, support, substantial reduction uh, in the corporate tax rate. Uh, in, 19, in 2017, sorry, in 2017, for the first time in modern history, House and Senate Republicans enacted major tax legislation without any Democratic votes. President Trump signed the legislation on de December 22nd, 2017, uh, two days after dozens of Republican legislatures had uh, bust to the White House uh, for a raucous celebration. Unsurprisingly, having been frozen out of the legislative uh, discussions, Democrats howled. House Democratic leader Nancy Pelosi described the legislation, I quote, as Armageddon, and added that a dark cloud hangs over the Capitol. She complained that it gave millions to wealthy Americans and large corporations and, quote, crumbs to middle and lower income citizens. Uh, even before Trump signed the legislation, the Democratic Senatorial Committee had revealed an ad claiming, quote, that the Republican tax scheme gives huge tax breaks to corporations but raises taxes on middle and lower income individuals. Republicans responded that bonuses of $1,000 paid by large corporations to their workers were hardly crumbs. Vice President Pence uh, said that he called them Christmas. Um, and Democrats who were planning to run for uh, election in 2018 in a, moder in a moderate or conservative uh, district immediately distanced themselves from uh, Nancy Pelosi's characterization of crumbs. Uh, the Democrats' complaints about the 2017 Act's reduction in the corporate tax rate from 35% to 21% uh, ring hollow. Uh, Democrats themselves had long realized that having an exceptionally high U.S. corporate rate in today's global economy with very mobile capital and IP income simply served as an invitation to both U.S. and foreign multinationals to locate their deductions, especially for interest and royalties in the United States, and to locate their income in low or zero tax countries. This obviously is not a recipe for economic success. Both before and after the 2017 Act, Democrats have urged a corporate tax rate from 25 to 28 percent. Donald Trump asked for 15 percent. So if Democrats had been involved in the legislation, in the, legislation the 21 percent rate that we ended up with would be in the realm of a reasonable compromise. 
Democrats, however, well understand that regardless of the economic disadvantages of a high corporate tax rate, railing against a low corporate tax rate has great political advantages. The uh, great irony is that the worst tax economically is the best tax politically. Uh, but regardless, a uh, lower corporate tax rate has long been overdue, uh, and I believe that raising it would be a large mistake. If Democrats are unhappy with the distributional consequences uh, that uh, uh, lowering the corporate rate will benefit high income shareholders, the appropriate remedy is to increase taxes at the shareholder level and not at the corporate level. The most difficult challenge that Congress faced in crafting this tax legislation was what to do about the international tax rules. The U.S. is not unique in this regard. How to tax the international income of multinational corporations is the most difficult issue of modern tax policy for countries around the world. It has been clear for a long time that the system of taxing international income that served the United States rather well for nearly a century had the combination of exceptionally high U.S. corporate rate and the sophisticated and creative tax planning ability of corporations and their advisors to shift capital and IP income into low-tax countries meant that our system, which had deferred U.S. tax on the income of foreign subsidiaries until their foreign earnings were repatriated to the United States, along with its foreign tax credits uh, that it provided, uh, had produced two and a half to three trillion dollars of earnings held abroad that could not be repatriated and invested in the United States without incurring a substantial tax cost. Other countries, such as the UK and Japan, had similar rules, but they had long, long ago abandoned them. Uh, but the creation of a new regime for taxing international income faced uh, major dilemmas. At the conceptual level, the normative underpinnings of the international tax system were broken. The idea of a compromise uh, between capital export neutrality and capital import neutrality offered no guidance to policymakers and had simply become an invitation to political mischief. The OECD's BEPS project that was initiated by the G20 in uh, 2012, along with subsequent uh, actions by the European Commission uh, and unilateral actions by some nations, uh, had made clear that the rest of the world was focusing on their ability to tax activities by U.S. multinationals in their countries, while the U.S. was continuing to insist that those revenues were ours. This uh, led the lead uh, U.S. Treasury negotiator uh, in the OECD, uh, Robert Stack, uh, in a 2015 conference uh, of the OECD, uh, to say that when he was negotiating at the OECD, he got the feeling that all the other nations wanted the U.S. to pay for everyone's drinks. He added that the U.S. was extremely disappointed in the output and in our collective failure to do more and better work than we've done. Uh, the difficulties of taxing international income um, are compounded uh, by the ambiguous and malleable nature of both source and resonance concepts as the foundational building blocks. Um, since uh, multinational corporations can change the character and location of capital income through innovative financial uh, instruments 
and can move IP income uh, through ownership and contractual uh, relationships uh, to low or zero tax uh, jurisdictions uh, and their long-standing ability to arbitrage differences in national tax rules uh, have led uh, to a tremendous ability to avoid uh, paying taxes uh, anywhere at, at a reasonable rate. Uh, in addition, nations around the world have engaged in aggressive tax competition, bidding down their tax rates uh, to secure the location of R&D jobs, capital flows, and investments. So Congress confronted a daunting challenge when deciding what rules to use to replace our failed foreign tax credit with deferral regime. There were essentially two options. First, uh, strengthen the source-based taxation of U.S. business activities uh, and allow the foreign uh, business income of U.S. multinationals to go untaxed or alternatively to tax the worldwide business income of U.S. Uh, multinationals currently with a credit for all or part of the foreign taxes they pay abroad. Faced uh, with a choice between these two very different uh, regimes for taxing the foreign income of U.S. multinationals, uh, Congress chose both. Um, I don't have time here, um, much less the energy to describe these uh, rules in any detail, uh, but let me give you a quick summary. First, we have a territorial system that exempts the foreign business income of foreign uh, corporate subsidiaries that are owned between 10 and 50 percent by U.S. multinationals. We have a similar exemption for income up to 10% of the adjusted basis in plant and equipment abroad for foreign subsidiaries that are more than half owned by a U.S. parent. Then, when the effective tar uh, foreign tax rate is less than 19%, a current tax, which is now 13.1%, but is scheduled to rise to 16%, uh, uh, is imposed on the current income of a foreign subsidiary on its income in excess of the 10% um, amount with a credit of 10% of the foreign uh, taxes uh, paid. There is also a special lower rate on the export income of U.S. goods and services a provision that rather clearly violates our WTO agreements uh, on goods, along with a minimum uh, source-based tax that depends on base eroding payments to uh, foreign uh, companies, whether parents or subsidiaries. So even that uh, brief uh, paragraph about its complexities uh, makes clear that we do not now have a stable set of international tax rules. Uh, fashioning domestic tax policy is, at least in principle, much easier. We routinely evaluate uh, domestic tax policy by asking two questions about equity. Are people who are similarly situated treated similarly? And is the burden of taxes distributed fairly? And we ask two questions about efficiency do tax rules inefficiently skew the allocation of resources, or do they unduly inhibit economic growth? Uh, some uh, people, no doubt, treat simplicity, the impact of the tax on administrative and compliance costs, as a, a third component, and others treat it as just one aspect of economic efficiency. Uh, but like the Congress, uh, we all pay lip service uh, to the idea of simplicity um, regardless of where we put it on our list. Um, I just want to describe three uh, important domestic aspects of this legislation. Uh, fortunately, I don't have to grade it. 
but you can grade it um, if you like. Uh, first, and I think most importantly in some sense, the um, representatives of partnerships, um, large and small, insisted that given the reduction in the corporate tax rate, that the tax rates on their income, which is taxed only to the owners and not at the entity level, must also be reduced. Business tax rate relationships have long played an important role in how businesses are organized. Before 1987, when corporate rates were much lower than individual rates, there were far more taxable corporations than there were partnerships and subchapter S corporations combined. Uh, but after the 1986 Act reversed these rate relationships, the number of uh, so-called flow-through entities uh, more than tripled. Uh, and in recent years, about two-thirds of the non-farm non business tax returns have been uh, filed by sole proprietorships, partnerships, limited liability companies, and subchapter S uh, companies. While most of these in numbers are small businesses, the advent and growth of private equity, uh, sovereign wealth funds, and business investments by university endowments and other tax-exempt entities have allowed flow-through businesses to amass very large amounts of capital without going to the public capital markets and therefore allowed them to avoid the corporate tax. Even though uh, most uh, net business income in the United States is still earned by large taxable corporations, nearly 45% of business income is now earned by these flow through uh, business entities, including many that are very, very large. The 2017 Act added a special, unique, and unprecedented 20% deduction for tax from taxable income for certain qualified business income, a rule that has the effect of reducing the tax rates of most partnerships, subchapter S corporations, limited liability companies, and sole proprietorships by 20%. So, for example, it reduces the tax rate on qualified income from 10% to 8% at the lowest bracket and from 37% to 29.6% at the highest bracket. Again, uh, the details are too complicated to describe here, uh, but the new law creates important new tax differences uh, between employees and sole proprietorships, including individual independent contractors, and among businesses that depend upon their levels of income, their kinds of business, and for higher income businesses, the amount of wages they pay and the size of their business assets. Never before 2018 have such sharp distinctions in tax rates been applied so broadly to varying industries and lines of business. And Congress justified this change as encouraging the growth of all independent businesses, uh, encouraging job creation and capital investment by non-corporate businesses, except for some non-corporate businesses, and reducing the incentive for non-corporate businesses to shift to the corporate form to take advantage of the 21% tax rate. The new law, however, denies the special 20% deduction to certain specified service businesses owned by upper income taxpayers, including the performance of services in the fields of health, law, accounting, actuarial science, the performing arts, consulting, athletics, financial services, brokerage services, investing, investment management, and securities uh, trading and dealing. Uh, but architects, engineers, and barbers are all eligible for the lower uh, rate. Uh, my very successful naturopathic physician uh, is clearly in the health business and will not qualify, uh, but I'm not sure about my personal trainer who is equally successful. 
doesn't seem like the health business uh, to me. Uh, because uh, this law turns its uh, rules for eligibility above an income threshold, uh, for um, 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 many uh, employers on the amount of their wages, my barber wants all of the hairstylists and uh, others in his salon uh, to be his employees. But of course, the hairstylists themselves want to be independent contractors in order to be eligible for the lower 20 percent, uh, for the 20 percent lower rate. Why did Congress lower the tax rate on uh, barbers and tailors, but not on doctors, lawyers, athletic, athletes, and actors? Uh, are hairstylists more beneficial to society than doctors? Um, maybe I'm the wrong person to ask that question. <laughs> and are hairstylists uh, who operate as independent contractors somehow uh, more worthy or beneficial to society than hairstylists who are employees. Although the tax rate is supposedly, this tax rate is supposedly a benefit for small businesses, many enormous businesses uh, clearly qualify. Uh, to just to take one example, the uh, construction and civil engineering firm Bechtel uh, is reportedly the eighth largest privately owned uh, company in the United States in 2017, uh, and it's organized as a subchapter S corporation, so its owners will qualify for the lower rate. Uh, is it sensible a policy to allow very large privately owned businesses to choose whether to be taxed as partnerships or as corporations. Uh, then let's take a quick look at the new rules on deductions for business expenses. Employees now cannot deduct their business expenses unless they are reimbursed by their employers. But independent contractors are treated as business owners, and so in addition to the 20% lower rate, they can deduct all of their business expenses even if they take the standard deduction. Whether one is an independent contractor or an employee is not, however, very straightforward. Due to an accident of history, for example, a generation ago, UPS drivers are apparently employees, while FedEx drivers are apparently independent contractors. The IRS and the courts now look to a list of 20 factors to be taken into account in distinguishing independent contractors from employees. These include whether the service provider performs according to instructions, training, and supervision of the contractor. The more instruction, training, and supervision that is provided, the more likely it is for the IRS to treat the person as an employee. On the other hand, as with other multi-factor tests in the tax law, the classification of the worker as an employee or an independent contractor is often uncertain and controversial. For example, whether my daughter's walker is an employee or an independent contractor probably depends on whether I tell her specifically what time and where to walk my dog and who supplies the pooper scooper or the doggy bags. <laughs> An Uber driver who uses her own car, chooses her own hours, and also drives for Lyft is almost certainly an independent contractor, not an employee. And many people who describe themselves as employees when asked by the census uh, now file tax returns as independent contractors. Uh, the number of uh, workers filing their taxes as self-employed has increased from 13% to over 16%, uh, even without the significant tax advantages that are now provided uh, to independent contractors. Um, I could ask, is it sound tax policy uh, to provide incentives that moves workers toward becoming independent contractors uh, but I want because the answer is obvious. There are other significant income tax uh, changes that affect individuals. Uh, the $10,000 limitation on state and local uh, income tax and property tax deductions 
uh, which was clearly targeted at politicians and voters in states that mostly vote Democratic, uh, is no doubt uh, the most controversial. But as my final example, I want to take up a provision that almost everybody, uh, with the exception of certain charitable organizations, uh, seems to like. That is the doubling of the standard deduction uh, to $24,000 for married couples and to $12,000 for single people. Uh, Republican leaders uh, for this change. Uh, they uh, said it would substantially increase the number of taxpayers who will not need to itemize, and they're certainly right about that. Uh, for a while, the president and Republican leaders in Congress uh, insisted that the change would allow the vast majority of taxpayers to file their tax returns on a simple postcard uh, but that was a claim that they soon abandoned as unrealistic. Unlike the previous examples that I've given, <clears throat> the question that I want to raise here is about opportunities missed. Uh, according to the Joint Committee on Taxation, this change is estimated to cost about a trillion dollars during the 10-year budget uh, period. Spending this money, I would argue, on expanding, simplifying, and reforming the earned income tax credit for both single workers and those with children would have been a far better policy choice. Uh, this change would have made work pay much better for lower and moderate income workers and could eliminate the debil debilitating marriage penalties of current law. So here, I think what we see is an important opportunity missed. It will be an interesting a year or so from now when people are filing their 2018 returns to see what the American people think of this legislation. It seems quite likely to me that next spring, many folks who are getting, now getting refunds of overwithheld taxes, especially in high tax states and localities where people fail to adjust their withholding for the loss of the state and local tax deduction, uh, we'll find out that they owe taxes rather than are getting a refund. There'll also be a lot of controversy in the country clubs of America and along the sidelines of children's athletic fields as some people brag about their unexpected tax windfalls and others lament the fact that they did not qualify. So the new law creates significant differences in tax based on what kinds of business is being, what kind of business is being conducted, where goods and services are bought and sold, whether individual uh, workers are employees or independent contractors, and where people live. Uh, no doubt, uh, analysts can find other provisions to praise and some to lament about in this uh, massive legislation, uh, but I want to close by discussing its most important shortcoming. Uh, pundits and politicians alike uh, have compared the 2017 legislation to the Tax Reform Act of 1986, calling it the most important tax revision in a generation. But unfortunately, uh, given our uh, ongoing deficits and the size of our debt, the 2017 legislation resembles the 1981 or 2001 legislation far more than the 86 tax reform. We have never in modern times faced such a dangerous imbalance between the levels of federal spending and income. At more than 75 percent of GDP, the federal debt owed to the public is now greater as a percentage of U.S. economic output than it has been at any time since the end of World War II. And back then, we had all the money there was. Europe and Japan were a shambles, and China was just entering into a dark communist era. No matter how bad our tax system was uh, during that time, our economy was poised to grow at an unprecedented pace. And the U.S. government then owed 98% of its debt to Americans. Now our national debt is rapidly heading toward $20 trillion, with about half owed to foreigners. 
And at a 5% interest rate, interest on the federal debt alone will cost more than a trillion dollars a year. If we fail to get control of the federal budget, rising interest costs will devour an ever larger share of federal revenues. Public debt growing to such levels will also lead to challenges to the dollar's role as the world's reserve currency. And our growing national debt increases the risk of uh, inflation and another uh, financial crisis. Over time, it may threaten the living standards of the American people. Given the size of the federal debt and the promises that have been made to the retiring baby boom generation for retirement and health insurance coverage, and the cost of what now seems to be an endless war on terror, we simply cannot afford the 2017 tax cuts. The major tax policy challenge of the 21st century in the United States is the need to address our nation's fiscal condition fairly and in a manner conducive to economic growth. But since California adopted Proposition 13 nearly 40 years ago, antipathy to taxes has served as the glue that holds the Republican coalition together. Even though our taxes as a percentage of our economy are low by OECD standards and low by our own historical experience, anti-tax attitudes have become even more important for Republicans politically since they now find it hard to agree on anything else. So revenue neutral or revenue producing tax reform, uh, at least as long as the GOP maintains its legislative majority, is politically impossible. Uh, Congress and the White House have gone to extraordinary lengths to disguise the ta size of the tax reduction they have created. The 2017 budget resolution required that the tax cuts not exceed an estimate of 1.5 trillion over 10 years in order to be enacted through reconciliation, which allowed the new legislation to pass the Senate with only 51 votes. But as with the George W. Bush tax cuts in 2001, Congress in 2017 enacted phase ends of tax increases and sunsets of tax cuts that combined to dramatically understate its actual revenue costs. When the 2001 uh, Bush tax cuts were enacted, the moderate Democrats in the Senate declared victory by reducing its estimated cost over a 10-year period from $1.6 to $1.3 trillion. But the bill was festooned with so many phase ends and sunsets and, and the like that its actual cost has been closer to $3 trillion than to one and a half. Here's what the 2017 legislation pretends. First, the sunsets of the individual tax cuts at the end of 2015 25, uh, which will almost certainly be extended, would cost an additional $600 billion through 2028. Second, extension of the business tax provisions that are scheduled to expire between 2019 and the end of 2025 would cost an additional $400 billion. Third, the extension of other tax provisions that are currently in place but are set to expire between this year and 2022 would cost another $450 billion. In combination, extending these provisions, all of which seems uh, likely, it would double the 10-year revenue cost of the 2017 Act from $1.5 trillion to nearly $3 trillion. Under the tax law that was enacted in 2017, the debt held by the public is estimated now to rise to more than 97% of GDP by 2028. And this does not account the omnibus spending bill signed last week by President Trump. If current tax policy remains in place, the federal debt uh, will uh, rise to 104% of GDP 
Uh, and if current spending levels are also maintained, the debt will rise to more than 110% of GDP. Under current law, the deficits for the coming 10 years are estimated to total around $13 billion. With deficits of over $1 trillion expected every year beginning either this year or in 2019. If the current policy levels of taxes and spending are maintained, deficits over the next decade will exceed $16 trillion, with deficits greater than 5% of GDP beginning in 2021. By 2026, current uh, policy uh, would produce deficits of more than 7% uh, percent of GDP annually, and this is clearly unsustainable. But the Republican deficit hawks, like uh, retiring Senator Bob Corker of Tennessee, who said he would not, quote, vote for any tax legislation if it added one penny uh, to the deficit, uh, these hawks became hummingbirds when the tax legislation came up for a vote. The 2017 legislation is a far cry from the, 20, from the 1986 tax reform. That legislation was not only revenue neutral, but it also made income uh, taxation far more equal regardless of its source. And the 1986 legislation was bipartisan, and the, 1917 legis the 2017 legislation, as I suggested, was passed without a single Democratic vote. So Democrats will soon be calling to repeal and replace the 2017 <laughs> Act. Um, the President and Congressional Republicans are now talking about enacting a second tax bill this year, uh, but this is just political kabuki. The Republicans would like to force the Democrats to vote not to extend the individual tax cuts uh, before the 2018 midterms, but that uh, seems an easy trap for Democrats to avoid. Uh, but the current tax system is unstable. Uh, we are a long way away from the economically advantageous, fiscally responsible, and simplifying tax reform that we uh, so uh, desperately uh, need. In 1990, when I was serving at the Treasury Department, uh, George H.W. Bush came to believe that the nation's fiscal situation required serious deficit reduction. And when George Mitchell, who was then the Democratic Senate Majority Leader, made clear that he would not consider sp significant spending cuts without uh, a, a tax increase, uh, nor would he consider tighter budget rules uh, without a tax increase. Bush agreed to increase taxes, violating what was then his famous read my lips, no new taxes pledge. He believed it was the right thing to do from the country, and he knew it might cost him re-election, and it did in no small part because of the betrayal of Newt Gingrich, who was far more interested in his own ambitions to be Speaker of the House than what, is, what was good for the country. Uh, five years later, Gingrich did become Speaker of the House after Bill Clinton raised taxes in 1993, again to address the deficit and this time with only Democratic votes. Uh, in the 1994 election, uh, Republicans captured the House of Representatives for the first time since 1954, and since then, political courage over the necessary level of taxes has become scarce uh, indeed. Uh, but let me not close on, on a note of only bad news. Uh, the budget legislation that was enacted in 1990 and 1993 along with the economic growth that was unleashed by the information technology revolution of the late 1990s, completely eliminated the projected deficits by the year 2000 and was uh, uh, producing a federal surplus for the first time since 1969. Uh, indeed, the budget surpluses being projected then by the Congressional Budget Office were so large 
uh, that in March 2001, the chairman of the Federal Reserve, Alan Greenspan, told the Congress that the federal government would soon pay off all of its national debt and would have to begin investing its surplus revenues in corporate um, um, stocks, a prospect that he abhorred. The good news is that that problem has been solved. <laughs> Thank you. I think you've got three minutes for questions or something before you have to, before you have to vacate the room. Yes, in the back. Um, so what's the solution? <laughs> <laughs> he has one. Actually, a couple of the books that are out there, he's tried it. So. Yes, that, that, was, that was not a planted question, but it was, <laughs> it was a welcome uh, question. Um, you know, I have long uh, argued that the nation needs a value-added tax. Uh, that's how other countries have managed to lower their income taxes. Um, if you enacted a value-added tax at about 10%, you could eliminate 150 million families from the income tax rolls by creating an exemption of $100,000. You could protect low-income families and workers from a tax increase through a combination of worker credits and, and child credits. Um, and uh, you could uh, pay for uh, the nation's uh, financial spending. Um, there are other revenue sources that have been proposed. The two most prominent ones are carbon taxes and uh, taxes on financial transactions or institutions. Um, I think that, that financial uh, transaction or institution taxes um, can only be done multilaterally and doing it unilaterally is not either likely or, or necessarily wise. And carbon taxes, based on what happened to the cap-and-trade legislation in the early Obama years, uh, carbon taxes, I think, are not likely to raise uh, significant amounts of revenue after you offset the burdens on low- and, and moderate-income families, which are disproportionate because they spend a huge portion of their income on energy costs, which they can't avoid, and after you pay off workers and in the fossil fuel uh, industry and shareholders in the fossil fuel industries. Um, so uh, I think those are your three choices, and the only one that makes any sense is a value-added tax, which I think 163 countries now around the world have. Uh, every country in the OECD has such a tax but the United States. Um, so we're, uh, <clears throat> and, I, and I have a book, uh, I think, entitled 100 Million Unnecessary Returns, Alice says it's up here, <clears throat> which goes into this in some detail. Yes? Mitigating, I'm sorry, the, what was the last thing? Oh, the deadweight loss from consumption taxation. Well, the deadweight loss from, it's easy to start there. The deadweight loss from consumption taxation is by all accounts uh, much less than the deadweight loss from income taxation, especially income taxation on business uh, income, whether corporate or non-corporate. Um, and the uh, uh, distributional uh, issues can be addressed by uh, limiting the income tax to high income taxpayers at whatever rate you like, they'll pay the value added tax plus the income tax. Uh, and at the bottom of the income tax scale, uh, the way to solve uh, these problems is not by exempting food or clothing or something that everybody buys, uh, but rather uh, by providing uh, uh, credits for children and credits for workers, either through payroll tax relief or through debit cards, which is the way we now uh, finance uh, what used to be called food stamps, but is now called SNAP. Uh, so you can make this, I mean, the proposal that I did has been scored by the Tax Policy Center. Uh, they got a grant from the Pew Charitable Trust. They tend to score presidential candidates' uh, tax uh, programs, not mine, um, but this is not an announcement of any sort. 
Um, um, but but they, have, uh, they have scored it to be uh, revenue neutral and distributionally neutral. Um, at, I would reduce the corporate rate to 15% under my proposal. I would tax large partnerships as corporations, I might add. But, the, uh, uh, but even with that, uh, there, you, could, you could probably do it now for about 10%. Uh, and if you only wanted to exempt people over Five hundred over fifty thousand dollars of income, rather than a hundred, and have some income tax still on on those people. You could probably do it for five or six percent value added tax, rather than ten percent. So I, I think there are lots of possibilities. Yes. What doesn't that look like? Given the, uh, states, well, the states now have retail uh, states and localities now have retail sales taxes. Uh, if you look at the Canadian experience, what you'll see is. Uh, that they created incentives for the provinces to conform. It took about 10 years uh, before the provinces uh, all conformed. I think the city of Quebec still has not conformed. Um, but, but it shows that you can have a federal VAT and a state and local uh, uh, sales tax operating simultaneously. Uh, it's not, there's not a barrier to that. Um, you know, it, it, uh, it, it will raise the rate, of course, in, in high tax high sales tax locations. Um, the nice thing about a VAT is that the base is significantly broader than a state and local tax base, sales tax base. So they could raise more revenue and not have cascading taxes on uh, businesses. So I think you can do it. This is the last question. Because um, Alice is here holding books, and I don't want her to fall over from home. <laughs> Um, it's, it's a good point. Um, I think that, that um, I, I think we're now in a situation where based on what the OECD has done and the, and the uh, uh, European Commission, that you're going to see corporate tax rates at the bottom between 10 and 12 and a half percent. And I don't think we help ourselves by having a particularly high business tax rate. Um, over time, uh, it, it clearly is the case that a significant portion of business taxes are borne by workers in the form of, of lower wages. Uh, people debate whether that number is 20% or whether it's 50%, and what do I mean by over time? I mean, surely in the short run, it benefits shareholders. Uh, but as I said in my prepared remarks, if you really are worried about the distribution of business taxes at the owner level, the answer to that is to impose the taxes on the owners, on the shareholders or the, or the owners of these um, flow-through businesses, rather than to impose them on, on the businesses themselves. So unlike the current tax on, share, on dividends, just to give you an example, or capital gains, which is now 23.8% if you count the Medicare tax, um, I, I would tax uh, those at the rate, the same rate that would apply to ordinary income, which is 37%. So, so you, don't need to have, you don't need to have a tax cut for people at the top in order to have a lower tax on business income, but you've got to pay for the lower tax on business income, which was not done. <laughs>